Okay, Rabotai, with your permission, we're going to continue the class here, Chatzar Yosef. Uh, we actually recorded this same lecture I'm about to tell you once before, but unfortunately there was a technical uh, error that the, the microphone didn't work, and therefore that whole thing was a failed effort. So I guess Hashem wanted me to say it twice. So I'm just going to hopefully just uh, catch you up to what we got up to so that the next video will go in the flow with what we're doing. We're learning, of course, the Chatzai Yosef, the deep stories of Masichet Gitin, um, <clears throat> chapter 14, section 1 is what we're up to. I'm just going to uh, continue where we left off of this series because, of course, we're talking about a famous story in the Gemara, not so famous, but I guess we're hopefully making it famous, a story in the Gemara where there was, uh, well, why don't we read the story and then we'll sort of uh, jump back to where we left off. The Gemara says, Masichet Gitin, Daf. Nun Zainab with 57a. The following story. There are three Chachamim that were sitting down together. They were talking about a place called Kfar Schania, a village of Schania in Egypt. It was a village where Jews lived in Egypt at the time. They said, if, ever, if anybody knows anything about this place, please come out and speak about it. So one of them opened up and said the following story about people from that place. There was an incident involving an engaged man and woman, a young couple who was supposed to get married from that city, and they were taken captive by Goyim, by the Gentiles. The Goyim told them, they married them off, so to speak. They told them, they commanded them to go in private and, 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 and have relations and create more babies so that the, the Goyim would have more Jews to ransom off and make more money. But when they were in that private room, the woman said to the man, remember, they're already basically married, but she said to him, please do not touch me, as I do not have a ketubah from you. Ketubah, of course, is a, is a rabbinic enactment, a rabbinic, well, according to the session of the well, it's the right of the Rabbanan, but it's a document, a document detailing the, the, uh, the uh, obligations that the man has towards the woman in marriage. It's a, it's a protection of the Jewish women. And because she didn't, they didn't get to that step yet, they weren't, uh, weren't able to draft one, she said to him, do not touch me. Because there is a, a Surah Rabbanan that a, a man is not allowed to live with a woman until he uh, writes this Ketubah. And what happened? He did not touch her at all until the day of his death. He died there in captivity. And when he died, she said to them, eulogize this man because he pit pit, he chattered with his yetzerara, with his evil inclination, more so than Yosef, the Yosef Atzadik, the son of Yaakov that the Torah speaks about. That's the claim she's making, that her betrothed was better than Yosef. Since in the case of Yosef, it was only one time, of course, she's, she's referring to Yosef and Potiphar's wife. In the case of Yosef, it was only one time. And whereas this man struggled with his passion against, with me each and every day. Additionally, in the case of Yosef, he was not in one bed with Potiphar's wife, whereas this man was in one bed with me. Also, in the case of Yosef, Potiphar's wife was not his wife. Therefore, it was a big sin to be with her. Whereas with this man, I, it was I who was his, technically his wife. So those are three reasons why she's tra trying to claim that her betrothed passed a greater test than Yosef at And we went through a few, you know, three, I think three lectures we went through detailing how this is a big problem. This should be a big problem. How can she claim that his test, the, the guy who passed away in the story, tragically, how could it be that he was better than Yosef Tzaddik? Yosef Tzaddik was one of the most fundamental people of Am, of Am Israel. He was connected on such a high, uh, he was, he was, the, the test that he was overcoming was on a much higher cosmic scale. We went into the detail last le uh, lecture uh, with the help of the Shnei Nechot about how deep and how detailed and how uh, uh, monumental Yosef Sadiq's test was when he overcame um, what he overcame with the, the tempt temptations of Potiphar's wife. I don't want to get into all that now, but with that all being said, how could it be at the end of the day that she said that this guy had a, was better than Yosef in that sense? So now we're going to go into the deep answer that we want to uh, uh, propose for that question. Page 212 is where we are. The answer, and ultimately the best interpretation, in our opinion, of the Gemara, is rooted in the fundamental, fundamental principle about free will, famously put forth by, put forth by Rabbi Eliyahu Desla throughout his work, that we must well understand. So we're going to give you a good introduction here about free will in general, the depth of free will in Torah, how it works, why it works, and the dynamics of it. This is the concept of what Rav Dessler calls Nikudata Bihira, literally the point of free will. Not the point as in 
the reason for free will. Like when someone asks you, what's the point? You're like, what's the purpose? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about literally a point, like a mathematical point on a scale. The point of free will. We have already mentioned that free will mainly operates in the arena of moral decisions, right? Free will is only something that pertains to, 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 to things that have to do with good versus evil. God's will versus not God's will, right? right? If a person makes a choice of a certain flavor over another flavor, the guy likes chocolate more than vanilla, or the guy likes sneakers more than dress shoes, or whatever. He likes to wear you know, a, a cardigan versus a button-down shirt. That's just a matter of preference. That's not necessarily sin versus mitzvah. That's just a matter of preference. That's not what we're talking about when we're talking about free will. We're only talking about decisions that matter in the moral realm. That's what we're talking about when we, when we mention free will, right? Okay, so we have already mentioned, yes. In the realm of moral choice, there is a graded absolute scale. Okay, imagine a mathematical scale. And on that scale, it's a scale of decision types that every individual can find himself on at any given time. The more refined the person is, the higher up on the scale he finds himself, and vice versa, right? The worse he is, the lower he is on, on, that, on that scale. The best way to illustrate this is with an example. Let's give an example. Now, the way a lot of this is, take is, uh, is uh, gleaned from the teachings of Rabbi Akiva Tatz in his book, Will, Freedom, and Destiny, Chapter 4. It's a really, really important work that I think every Jew should understand and know and study. We're taking just a few points from there and sort of uh, tying it in with our Gemara. So, following example. A thief who habitually engages in violent crime. He's a criminal. He would find himself on the lower end of the scale since he is struggling with more major transgressions, like the big scale things, right? Not only Acknowledged by Torah to be wrong, but by society in general. Everyone agrees stealing is wrong, and this guy is a stealer, you know, he's an abuser and, and a thief on a regular basis. The higher end of the scale, however, would be populated by a more refined personality who instead struggles with much more, a much more refined problem, which is whether or not, for example, such as whether or not to taste the delicious milk fu chocolate fudge when only five hours had passed after his last bite of steak, right? When we're talking about the, the halakha, the rule, the, uh, that uh, the Chachemim put in force, that you're not supposed to eat, you're not allowed to eat dairy products six hours, within six hours of eating meat products, right? That's what we're referring to. Uh, the reason is because you don't want to mix meat and dairy in your stomach. There's a famous reason, the Rambam and the Rashi, without getting into the reason for it, but that is a halakha that we must follow. Um, a person who's struggling with that thing, with that halakha, is a much more subtle, smaller thing than someone who's struggling with, you know, knocking out old ladies and stealing things. So that person is much more along on the scale on the, towards the right side of, of the, the free will scale that we're talking about. Revisiting the thief, however, we'll go back to the thief for a second. The dilemma going through his mind is the following. What is he actually struggling with in his mind? The next time he plans to rob an old lady's purse, whether he should refrain from his usual complimentary knockout punch to the left eye also or not. It sounds funny, but he's thinking, that's something he's really struggling with. When I steal the next lady's purse, should I just grab the purse and run? Or should I also stick it to her and give her a nice elbow to the face while I'm doing it? You know, he's really struggling with that. It sounds funny, but he's on that level. To the one struggling with the six-hour meat and dairy rule, right, the struggle of the thief seems absurd. It seems crazy. But this is only because he has graduated his point of free will well along the scale. He's much higher up on the scale. And when this occurs, when the point of free will that we're talking about moves along the scale, everything behind that point is inconceivable, absurd, and taboo. Seems crazy. The same is true on the opposite end. When the thief's point of free will is low, all the way down here, he could never imagine himself being a righteous, practicing, God-fearing individual, right? To him, rabbis are aliens, like, they don't exist, it's impossible to be that righteous, right? It is inconceivable to him that someone would stop and think before eating what his heart desires. He just eats and that's it. The crucial detail here is that the magnitude of difficulty describing the internal moral struggles both these people are dealing with are proportionally the same relative to each one's level of development, meaning they're both dealing with the same level of struggle in their minds when they're dealing with their moral dilemma that faces them. 
This is because the only, this is because the struggle is concentrated at the respective locations of each one's point of free will. The point of free will is the place in your mind, in your development, in your life, where you feel a tug of war between good and bad forces in your mind. <clears throat> a struggle is meaningful only when the opposing forces of do I do this or do I not do this are balanced, which is where free, real free choice exists. That's where real free will exists. Rav Dessler's analogy for the point of free will is thus. When two countries are at war, right? Despite the fact that the entire countries are at war, the pain and destruction and death is most significantly felt, significantly felt at the front lines. That, that line where the territories are being pushed back and forth between the two sides. As the battle rages and one side advances, the zone of conflict shifts with it, wherever that line is. That's the point of free will. The territory that was that, that that was the battlefield last week is now tranquil, tranquil and peaceful. Right? They already moved past that point. Conquered territory because the battle moved to a further territory. In the same way, the internal war between good and evil always has a front line somewhere. The land behind it is conquered and calm, and the land beyond it seems beyond reach at this point. But the front line itself is where bombs are being dropped and where soldiers are lost. The small victories are what eventually win the war, right? Same thing, apply that to the concept of free will. It's all those small victories. The, the, the more and more bracha that you're saying, the more kavanah you're having in, 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 when, you're, when you're praying, the less, you know, the more control you have of your emotions, the less, uh, the less impulsive you are with your speech. All these little things that add up to eventually build a refined tzaddik, right? No one becomes a tzaddik overnight like that. <clears throat> In the same way, the internal struggle so this, right? But of course, this point on the scale where a hard decision must be made is unique to each person's life situation and current stage of personal development at that time. An assertion of the will is required to climb higher along the scale, meaning no one will ever just climb along the scale just by being passive. Uh, you know, I'll just see what happens and live with it. That will never work. Why? Because there's always a constant resistance against you. That's the design of the test of life, right? It's, there's a ladder. If you're not climbing the ladder, gravity will pull you down. Or think of a stream over, or like a river of some sort. If you're not going against the, the river, the stream, fighting against it, it will pull you with it the other way, right? What's that pull in life that's always pulling us, trying to pull us down? That's the yetzerara, the evil inclination. That's the reason of life. If you don't have that, there's no point because there's no... Nothing that you're overcoming, nothing that you're earning. You have to overcome struggle in order to be considered earning something. Right? An assertion of the will, like we said, okay. An assertion of the will is required to climb higher along the scale. Leaving things to their natural order or going with the flow is a guarantee to skid down. Going with the flow. You ever meet a guy, how's it going? Everything? Yeah, I'm going with the flow. Wherever the wind takes me, I go. That's the most bogus answer. You could ever think of that means that this person doesn't care about his life whatsoever he has no plan he has no goals he has nothing now again i'm not saying that you everything's going to always going to work, work out to plan right because at the end of the day we're following god's plan but you have to have some basic skeleton of a plan of, of what you what you're trying to at least accomplish and then there, and then you have to pray to god for that to work out if you don't have any of that you're just going with the flow it's a it's, a, it's, a, it's an empty life it's a meaningless life there's something called mazal. Mazal is, means fortune, right? It literally means the constellations. There's 12 constellations, which means different shapes of stars that people, the astronomers uh, describe when they, when they look up at the, in the night sky. And in the, in the Torah and Gemara, this concept is brought down that mazal, there is a sort of fl, this, uh, influence that each person uh, is influenced by their mazal. And that depends on the day they were born, the time they were born. Um, and that is true to an extent, right? Uh, uh, people love this stuff uh, all over the place. You know, what's the thing called in English? Horoscope. Horoscope. People love this horoscope thing, right? Is, this, is there some truth to it? Yes, absolutely. It's based on the Torah. But that concept is that a person's mazal, a person's horoscope, is just his baseline uh, default of what will be if you do nothing. But the, the, the secret is that, you, that God gave the power to overcome this to Abraham Avinu's descendants, the, the Jewish people. He gave them the power to overcome whatever default mazal, mazal they have with 
you know, applying themselves in prayer and, and, and mitzvot, they're able to overcome whatever they're limited by in their mazal. The word mazal comes from the word nozli, which means liquid, which flows. So perhaps this, uh, this phrase, going with the flow, came from that somehow. Maybe, maybe not. But maybe but what a person is essentially saying, when he says, I'm going to flow, he means I'm, I'm bound to my mazal. I am not trying to overcome whatever happens to me happens and I don't care. And that's not the way a Jewish person should literally live his life. As one moves higher along the scale, the ordeals, the tests one is tried with uh, and uh, become more and more subtle and nuanced. Little things. Things a novice would not interpret as a, as a test at all. The bulk of a person's judgment after death is determined by how far he moved along the scale and where on the scale he ends up. Right, so if a person, so if we were to give arbitrary numbers, let's say person A was born level twenty, and he overcame and he worked hard in his life, and he, by the end of his life he was at level sixty, so he moved forty points up, versus person B who was born at level ninety-five, and then he only moved to level ninety-six in his life, one more, one point up. Overall, this guy is much more holy. Person B is ninety-six, is extremely holy, picked up the whatever it is, but how much? Where did he start? Where did he finish? Just one point movement. This guy, however, was put in a much more difficult situation and he moved 40 points ahead. So this, that's going to be a huge consideration in God's judgment that this guy, in some way, was better than this guy. The Ben Yehoyada, which is the Ben Shechai, he glossed at this point as well when he brought down the Gemara Masechet Sukkah that says, Kol gadol gadol Anyone who's, who is greater than his friend, his yetzer is greater than his as well. Right? This is an important concept that as a person grows in his spiritual development and refinement, his yetzerara, his, his personal uh, uh, handcrafted, custom-made resistance to pull him down also grows with him. Otherwise, it's not a test. It needs to be balanced. In other words, as one moves up on the scale, the weight of the pull to fall back down is increased in order to maintain the struggle at the, at the point of free will as a genuine battle rather than an unfair match. Right? Here's an analogy, note number 23. A skilled tennis player playing tennis against someone who has never picked up a racket before cannot be considered a competition at all. Neither can the same skilled player challenging a world champion tennis player. It's also not a match. It's not, it's not his level. Only when his opponent is someone more or less on his playing field can it, be, can it be said that there was an actual game that was played, an actual fair game. Such a match is what occurs at the point of free will. As one becomes a better spiritual gamesman, so to speak, his yetzerara buffs up too, in order to take the form of a commensurate equal oppon opponent to make sure there is always a competitive game being played, the ultimate game of life. That's what it is, right? Life is that ultimate game. Where every single day is another championship game against your your biggest, you know, uh, adversary. Who's that? The old you. You're always going up against the old you. And as long as you beat him in the long run, you have something to say. You've actually made it in life. Good. Thus, growth begins with, with uh, growth brings new tests, new ordeals. The warrior honing his skills must face greater adversaries, adversaries and opponents as he develops. His enemies become more fearsome and more dangerous, but he is becoming a mightier warrior at the same time, and the balance of power is preserved. The battle becomes more dangerous, but his skills remain commensurate and equal with his enemies, and as the battle becomes fiercer and potentially more lethal and more deadly, there is constantly more to lose, but there is also always more to gain in the victory as well. That is a... Uh, that was straight from Rabbi Akivitat's book, Will Freeman Destiny, page 45. Look over there. Coming back to our Gemara. Now that, we, now that we understand this very important fundamental introduction to life, pretty much, um, we can finally try to answer the question of our Gemara. The captive woman is not saying that Yosef would have been able to withstand, would not have been able to withstand the test that her betrothed did. Surely he would have. Of course, Yosef at Sadiq would have been able to overcome whatever he, he overcome. Nor does she mean that her betrothed was higher than Yosef on the absolute scale, right, of the overall numbers. Surely Yosef's absolute level is unfathomable to most, much higher, evidenced by his involvement in major rep reparations of the creation, like we explained in the previous lecture. Please look over there. Yosef Tzaddik was basically paving the way for the Jewish people on a much higher scale. So she's not equating them in that sense, that they're, they're, they're the same level of greatness. What she is saying instead is, like what we said before, that when considering the respective locations of their points of free will in both of their lives, her betrothed 
could have made a much larger leap, jump along the scale than Yosef HaTzadik did in his life. Notwithstanding, Yosef was, was uh, surely much farther up on the absolute scale of greatness and mastering the will than her betrothed was. And if he, at his current level, was placed in Yosef's stead, right? If this guy was put in Yosef's position to try to overcome Potiphar's wife, he would have probably easily succumbed to Potiphar's wife and failed. But this is besides the point because she, she only meant to highlight one fact. She meant to highlight that her betrothed is des deserving of great praise for the individual leap upwards on his personal scale that he was able to achieve because at the end of the day each person is judged on his own personal scale not on uh you know, you know when you when a person dies it's not going to be judged why weren't you as good as Moshe Rabbeinu no the question is why weren't you as good as you could have been right same thing here this guy made a huge leap on his scale let's say from 40 to 90 who knows right a big jump whereas Joseph's jump maybe not as much but he, nevertheless he was still on a much higher level but his jump maybe was not as much that's the point she was trying to say that's the point she was trying to praise about him. The precise reading in the language of Agamara makes this explanation shine even more brightly. Look what it says. She said to them, after she was saved and redeemed, she said to the people, the Jewish people, eulogize this man who pit pit, this interesting word, peitet peitet, which Rashi explains to mean chattered, conversed, talked with his yetzer more than Yosef. She did not say outright that he was better than Yosef. She never used those words. Rather, she spe specifies that he overcame his own personal yetzer in this one localized situation more than Yosef overcame his own personal yetzer at that one localized situation with Potiphar's wife. Now let us uncover a depth about the unusual terminology of the word pit pit, peitet, peitet. The word is a conjugation, I'm sorry, a conjunction, conjunction, meaning a doubling of the word pat. Peitet. Not peitaf. Peitaf means bread. Pat. Peitet is in this word pit pit twice. The word peitet by itself means a stalemate. You know what a stalemate? Stalemate means a draw, a tie during a competition or a match or whatever it is. A stalemate is a draw. No, no winner. No clear winner. And a doubling of it into the word pit pit connotes an emphasis of the matter, a super stalemate of sorts, right? This plays right into the concept of the point of free will that we have been talking about above, be, uh, since that is where the real existence of the will can be found. Like we said, the inner forces are balanced, pulling towards both sides of the moral dilemma, what one might call a stalemate, an even match between the yetzer and yetzer tov, good inclination and bad inclination inside your mind, they're having a stalemate where? At the point of free will. That's the only place. Often, one experiences this conflict within the self in the form of a discussion, a chatter, right? A pit put between the two versions of oneself, the one inspired by the good inclination and the one possessed by the yetzerara. The two sides of you that are talking to each other about whether or not to do the, to do the following thing. During the debate that happens, the point of stalemate between both forces is frequently crossed. The doubling of the word pitput also indicates the two directions that the will is being pulled back and forth, to and fro. Right? The colloquial saying to express difficulty choosing something is, I'm torn between so-and-so, I'm torn between these two options. It's that internal conversation you have with yourself. You know, should I do this? But you know, you really shouldn't be doing this. But I really want to, and I know it's going to feel good, but I know it's not what God wants me to do. And that's that internal struggle that we're talking about. These are the scars worn by Yosef, the scars worn by the captive men in our Gemara, and anyone else who battles the Yetzirah. The Torah harbors secrets in a lot, in a myriad of facets, in a lot of different ways. One of those facets is the following thing I want to go into. Something called the melodic notation assigned to the words in the verses. We call it in Hebrew, ta'ameh mikra. The notes that the chazan has to use and, uh, when he reads the Sefer Torah, right? In shul, Monday, Thursday mornings, and Shabbat mornings, and holidays, you take out Sefer Torah, and the chazan has to know the melody. That's why usually there's somebody standing next to him giving him the signs, so he, so he sings them properly. Besides knowing how to pronounce the words properly, he has to also know how to sing the words properly. And each 
there's a note, and you have to learn them, and each one has a certain uh, tone. There's one note that's called a shalshelet. It's very rare. Seldom appears, uh, appears throughout Tanakh. In the actual five books of Moshe, the Chumash, the Torah, it only appears, I believe, four times. Four times, I believe, it appears. It looks like a back and forth zigzag line, like this. Literally, a back and forth zigzag line over the word. You know, not in the actual Torah. In the actual Torah, we don't put the notes, right? It's, it, that's a, it's part of the oral tradition. That's part of the secret part that you're only supposed to learn from your rabbi. It's not out there for the whole world to see. And the, the way you sing this note of Shashelet, Shashelet literally means a chain. The way you sing it is with an emphatic back and forth quiver in the voice. Ashkenazim and Sephardim have a different, a slightly different way of doing it. Ashkenazim go, Shalashelet, a funny back and forth sound. And, Ashken- and the Sephardim also have a similar one. I'm not going to do it now because it sounds really funny. But just believe me that Sephardim have also sort of a back and forth tone to sing this note. And of course, nothing in Torah is without, without its depth. So what's the depth of this note? It makes one of its rare appearances over the word Vayma'en. And he refused. Referring to Yosef's refusal of Potiphar's wife. When Yosef said no to Potiphar's wife, that's the note that appears. Vayma'en. Back and forth. Thus the Torah depicts for us, visually and audibly with this note, the struggle. That's what it's, that's what it's showing you. What's the, what does this note mean? It means there's, ha- there's an internal back and forth, pit put. A struggle happening between the good and bad inclinations in that person. The struggle that people put that one must perform to make a viable decision in life. Not coincidentally, all the other three times in the Torah that this Shashalat appears are directly dealing with someone's internal struggle with a moral decision. What are the examples? No, no number 27, I'll go through them with you quickly. Bereshit 19.6, that happens uh, with regard to Lot, the nephew of, of, of Abraham Avinu. When the angels came to take Lot out of Sodom, because they wanted to destroy Sodom, but Lot didn't want to leave because he had riches over there, a lot of money. And then over the word, Vayit Mah Mah, which means that he delayed, there's this Shashu that appears. Why? Because he delayed, because he, he had an internal struggle. Because he loved his money so much, but he wanted to live. He had to choose money or life. The internal back and forth. The, the next time it appears is Bereshit 24.12, regarding Abraham's uh, servant Eliezer. Eliezer wanted his daughter to marry Abraham's son, Yitzchak. But Abraham told him no, because Eliezer was a Canaanite, and the Canaanite were cursed people. Noah cursed them. And Abraham said, my seed are blessed. God blessed them, so we can't mix blessing and curse. And not only that, Abraham appointed Eliezer to go find a wife for Yitzchak. So it was very difficult for Eliezer to do do that, to be loyal to his uh, master and fulfill his will. But he did it. It's over the word, I believe, Vayomar. And he said to him, Back and forth struggle. The third place it appears is, appears is Vaikra 8.23 with regards to Moshe Rabbeinu during the inauguration of the temple of the Mishkan, sorry, I'm sorry, the tabernacle, the Mishkan, in the, in the uh, desert. There was an eight-day inauguration period where Moshe Rabbeinu specifically, uh, not eight days, I'm sorry, there were seven days, just before the eight days, where Moshe Rabbeinu acted as the first uh, effective Kohen Gadol, doing several anointings and, uh, and sacrifices to start up the work, the service of the Mishkan. And when he was doing that, he had to shecht certain animals, and on the word Vaishchat, and he shechted, and he slaughtered one of the animals, that Shalashilat appears again. He had a back and forth internal struggle. What's the struggle there? The struggle was that he really felt maybe he should stay as Kohen Gadol, as the as the righteous, as the uh, High priest, instead of his brother, because right after that his brother was supposed to take over his his, plot, his spot forever. His brother and all his descendants forever, all the Kohanim, and because of that internal struggle, that Shalat appears again. This plays further into the concept of the point of free will that we've, that we've been discussing. If the test is more difficult than it could be handled by the person, then it would be beyond one, one's capacity to overcome, an almost certain failure. If the, if the test is too easy, then it would not be a test at all, an almost certain, almost certain victory. Both instances would be unjust and unfair. God created a fair world. It is no coincidence that the word pitpet, pitput, has the same gematria, by the way, same numerical Hebrew value, as the word matzliach, successful. Right? It's the word that we say, for example, 
uh, at a Sheva Barachot. After a couple gets married, when we do the special blessings after the Bukhat Amazon, there's two cups of wine and we, we mix them and we say Matzliach, 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 and we give it to the Chatan to drink. What's Matzliach? It means successful. How does a person become truly successful? What is the definition of, of successful? Successful Matzliach has the same gematria as Pitpet, as chattering with the Yetzirah. Nothing can be considered a true success or triumph unless Pitput, challenging, going back and forth with your, with your internal Yetzirah, unless that occurs along the way. After that happens, then you know you have a real chance at success. And that is the end of this section of this chapter. Baruch Hashem, we'll get through it. Next time we're going to start section two. Baruch Hashem, Amen, Amen.